All right. My name is Rick Rampton, and uh, Sauce Lab, I'm with QA Source, and Sauce Labs has uh, kindly hosted this webinar for us, and we're looking forward to um, a great, a great little presentation for you today. So, um, again, Sauce Labs, Selenium, Appium, the, you know, all of you on the webinar today, the greater testing community, it's awesome, and we're so happy that we're able to participate in the open dialogues, and we're really glad we're be, are able to be here today with you and share some of the items we've learned doing business in QA for the last many years, 12 years. So I just want to welcome everyone out here, um, and thanks Sauce Labs for hosting the webinar. <clears throat> My name is Rick Rampton with QA Source, and I am one of QA Source's customer success managers. I've been working with QA Source clients for the last four years now, and, and one of the things that I hear often, and one of the reasons why our clients come to us to start with, is because they want to ensure their automation is successful. And what that means to them, or what you know, being successful in automation means is they're actually using it, number one, they're getting value from it, and able to show the value, and they're not paying too much to maintain it. So that's why we put together this webinar, and and uh, which is going to cover, you know, different ways to make sure your automation is successful. So I'm going to introduce our, our speaker here in just a minute, who is the CEO of QA Source. And uh, but first, I just wanted to do two quick things: a quick introduction about QA Source to show that uh, we have experience and our experts in this topic, and and two, just do a quick poll so that we can understand who you are today and who's participating. <clears throat> so first, QA Source. QA Source. <clears throat> has a strong focus in automation, and we've been doing automation for over 12 years, and we provide QA services to a host of different product development companies in the U.S., and over the last 12 years of automation, we've worked with a variety of different clients and built out many different automation frameworks. we built frameworks such as data-driven, hybrid, object-oriented, using different tools such as Selenium, QTP, Telerik, others which you may or may not have heard of, like Squish, which is a cross-platform tool. We've also worked with many mobile tools like Appium and Calabash and even built our own proprietary tools. And of course, we've done this with a variety of different languages such as Java, PHP, Python, Perl, Ruby, and this goes on, and using a host of other technologies like Jenkins, Mavens, TestNG, Git, bug bases, test case management systems, and again, the, li the list goes on. So, so really, over hundreds of frameworks later, we've really learned the best ways to build maintainable, robust, portable automation suites from a technical perspective. But we've also learned how to measure that automation in order to optimize it and to continue to show the value that it's bringing to the business and, and to the engineering teams. Awesome. So before we dive into what makes automation successful, I just want to take a minute to have you answer a few poll questions so we can get to know you better. <clears throat> Um, on the screen, you will see the three questions, and I'm going to um, start the poll now. So you'll see a pop-up on your screen on the side panel, hopefully, that has three different questions. Um, so please answer these questions. The first question is, how large is your current QA team? So the one that you manage, the one that you're a part of, um, this can be both manual automation engineers. We're just interested in learning the size of the team that you're a part of. The second question is what is the main reason you want to measure your test automation? So, again, for this question, I'd imagine if, if we, if there was the option, we'd all write all of the above. But if you have to choose one, we'd, we'd love to just learn from you as a QA professional what you feel is your number one priority. And, and of course, if you're uh, not a managerial level yet, tell us the reason if you were a manager. You know, what, what would you do? So we'd love to hear from you there. And the last question is, how would you rate your current automation metrics? Or how would you rate yourself on how good you are measuring your team? Just give us an idea of, of what, this, this just gives us an idea of where you're at with your metrics. So this is great. Um, I'm seeing some polls come in. So I'm, I'm going to give you about, well, maybe 10 or 15 more seconds. I'm seeing them. They're coming in quite a bit. So yeah, please keep answering the questions. 
We'll close it out in maybe 10 more seconds or so. Good. So I, I'm seeing a, a large number right now. I'm, I'm not closing it out quite yet because I still have answers coming in. But so far, I'm seeing about, um, you know, as far as the QA team size, it's, it's on the, the smaller end, you know, less than five or five to ten members. Um, but we have a pretty good mix. We have, you know, teams with uh, more members as well. So, so we have a good mix here. That's good. Um, for the main reason you want to measure um, and your test automation, I have the greatest reason is to utilize resources effectively uh, at 40 percent. Um, so that's great because we actually, in this presentation, we talk a lot about how to measure your team uh, from a team holistically and from an individual basis. So this is awesome. And um, lastly, how would you rate yourself? Um, this is kind of as I, as I was expecting, which is we're kind of in the the uh, needs improvement, no metrics at all. So no metrics at all is 22%. Needs improvement is 31%. And base pretty good is 21%. So again, pretty even across the board on that. So I'm closing the poll now. Awesome. Thanks so much for, for answering that. And so, again, I think we have a great information that will help us speak to you directly today. And um, I'm very confident that you'll get some insights. And um, also, for you who want more after this presentation, we will be providing a free guide with 20 different metrics, in addition to the ones, or including the ones that we talked about today, um, that you can use and check out at your perusal. So, Without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today, who is Rajiv Rai. So Rajiv is the QA or the CEO of QA Source, and he has over 20 years of experience in QA, and is widely recognized as an expert in building, managing, and retaining high-performing engineering teams. So prior to founding QA Source, Rajiv led QA initiatives at Apple. Informix and Macromedia, and Macromedia was subsequently bought by Adobe. Uh, Rajiv built and sold Qualitest, who was an early pioneer in QA technology and processes before he found a QA source, and he found a QA source in 2003. Rajiv has grown QA source from small teams of three engineers to an international organization of over 600 people now. And these 600 professionals are servicing, at QA Source, we're servicing clients that range from VC funded startups to the Fortune 500. Again, QA Source, under the leadership of Rajiv, has grown 20 to 50% yearly and is a market leader in test automation. And QA Source customers, by the way, have had successful exits, um, exceeding $11 billion in MA transactions. And this has led to our slogan, Quality That Creates Value. So with great pleasure, I will turn it over to Rajiv for an awesome presentation on how to measure your way to successful automation. Rajiv. Rick, thank you for the introduction. Uh, you're very kind. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you all about metrics that enhance and optimize your test automation. And I noticed in the poll, you guys said, you lay your resources effectively, and that is one of the things we'll be talking about. As Rick mentioned, I've been building high-quality QA teams for over 20 years. Um, build teams that are really valued by the business and respected by the developers, and teams that are proud of the products they deliver. During this QA journey, I've faced all sorts of challenges, and I've learned, at least for me, the best way to deal with them is to be proactive rather than reactive. And this mindset is what allowed me to face all the QA challenges head on and really turn these challenges into strengths. And you ask, what are some of those challenges that we faced? Um, basically, any QA manager, you know, first and foremost, shipping a high quality product on time. That's the biggest thing, ship a high quality product on time and knowing if you have the right staff 
uh, right resources to ship the product in time, staying within budget by investing on the right areas, and constantly measuring our team to really measure them so that we can optimize our team's efforts, we can optimize our resources where they should be deployed. How did we overcome these challenges? To overcome, we have invested heavily into automation and have learned that test automation, if built and managed correctly, can drive a lot of value to the product and business. And I hope at the end of this presentation, I would have given you some ideas on how to measure your automation efforts and overcome those challenges. Over the years, we have found a formula that enables us to implement and optimize test automation that is successful. Automation that gets used throughout the life cycle of the product. Automation that does not just sit on the shelf, but actually gets used with every build or throughout the build and release process. Automation that developers rely on to verify their code. Automation that is part of your continuous integration. Automation that developers use before they check in a fix to make sure their code is not going to break a build. Um, but how? How were we able to track success and make a business case for automation? What metrics did we use? How were we able to get a budget for management to build an automation team? And or use a product like Sauce Lab, which adds a lot of value. And a lot of this really depended on making a solid and measured business case for successful automation effort. This is what we're going to talk about in this webinar, measuring your way to successful automation. Today, we're going to show you metrics and charts that are going to help you get budget from your management and show them the value of automation and really optimize your test automation efforts. And you'll get a budget and then obviously uh, you need to continue to optimize your effort and showing the value. And we realize that each company develops software differently. Each team works differently and has different goals. And we get that. So many of the metrics that we show today can be adopted to fit your needs. We worked with over 150 clients. And some of the teams have been successful without use of much metrics, which was really evident from the poll that many of you don't have any metrics. And that is okay too. This could be a result of many factors. You, know, you have abundant, abundant resources available to you. Uh, maybe your product is not as complex, or maybe you just have superstar developers and superstar QA team, and you don't require any metrics, or you've been just lucky. So if you have been successful, without measuring your automation, and that's okay. And however, what we have found with, and from our experience, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And that's really what we're focused on, really. Uh, improving by measuring. And over the years, we have measured effectiveness of our QA teams many different ways. And at QA Source, you know, my teams um, continue to define our measuring criteria for our clients. And I give them a lot of credit, and really, every day they're coming up with new metrics. And, and there are fairly standard metrics I'm sure many of you use. Um, how many bugs are found, how many bugs are closed, what types of bugs are from being found by severity, by priority, what is the find versus fix ratio, what's the test execution status, test cases blocked, failed, passed, number of open bug trends, bugs by engineer, I mean, a whole host of them, or even for automation. What's my code coverage like? What's my false positive ratio? Or what's my execution time? I mean, this can go on and on, right? There's lots of metrics. And we're gonna give you 20 of those metrics uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, all these metrics exist, and they're all important. But today, we're not going to talk about any of these metrics. What we're going to talk about today is really specific to getting budget for your automation, showing value to the business for your automation. When I say business, I meant by your management, your CFO, your VP of engineering, whoever controls the purse, and optimize your test automation in order to make your automation successful. Okay. Let's get into it. 
as, as we know, automation is not a replacement for manual, manual testing. It really is not. Uh, automation complements it, of course. And when you want to implement automation, one of the big challenges that we have found with our clients or early on in my career, there was just never budget for automation because we were given a certain amount of budget and we needed to get the release out the door. And sure enough, what did we do? We just put manual testers on, and really there was no automation. And we had to figure out a way how to really get a budget. And it's really no rocket science. And what we have learned over the years is really to break it down very, very simple. Um, your VP of engineering or your CFO, again, whoever controls the budget, what do they want to see? What we learned, they would like to see a positive return on their investment. And you know when you can do automation, you're going to be investing more upfront, whereas your QA budget is going to go up. Okay? But if you can show a positive return on the investment to exec team, then you will usually get a budget. In the next few slides, um, I'm going to talk about real life examples of, a, as a matter of fact, a recent product, recent client we work with. And what I show you may look very simple. Believe me, there is a, many companies we've been to, we talk to many QA managers, they just don't think of automation this way. And if you do think of it this way, great, then I'm in your camp. So, great. So, how do we get automation budget? So, first thing we do is break even in automation. You know, if you want to go, just kind of like anything you do, if you want to get a budget, you got to show them, hey, I'm going to get a break even, then I'm going to make a return for on your investment. And this particular release, uh, for, the thing, for the sake of brevity, for simplicity, we are only going to talk about one module. But in this particular release that we worked with, actually had six different modules. And, and first and foremost, what do we do? Um, before we start the project, we look at it. Hey, can we automate something? What can be automated? What cannot be automated? What should be automated? What should not be automated? And really, what kind of return on investment? And return on investment, we really look at is how much manual effort we're going to save if we invest into automation. In this product, there were six modules. Two of them just did not make sense because they were not going to be used over and over again. Automation really makes sense when you're going to be exercising a feature over and over again through the life of the product or even beyond. Okay, two of them did not make sense. Four of them did make sense and we started to automate. And I'm going to show you an example of the one that we did automate. This particular feature, when we estimate it, we estimate it will take us about 147 hours to automate. And great, that's our cost. Well, then what are we going to save? Well, we're going to save about 115 hours of manual effort. And that doesn't sound like a great investment. You know, you spend 147 hours to save 115 hours. But this particular feature will be tested, it will be part of a larger release, it's going to be tested over and over again, and in the first six months, as we're building automation, it took us about 147 hours, and we saved 115 hours, but when we look at a larger effort, guess what happens? We are going to save over 300 hours in just the next six months. And now when I take this type of a data to CFO, I say, hey, I'm going to automate this thing for you, and it's a 147 hours to automate, I'm going to save over the next six months or a year, 300 hours of manual effort. And that makes a lot of sense. Now it just kind of like becomes a no brainer not to fund you. Uh, yes, there's a little bit of investments up front, but when you show them this way, they will fund your effort. You know, and kind of like it's one of those gifts that keeps on giving. That's what automation really is. It's a gift that keeps on giving. You invest into it. Okay, so now we've, you've gotten the budget and you are starting to automate. Now, one of the things that we want to make sure that we continue to use this automation, we continue to show the business that we are adding value, okay? And, and how do we get the budget and how do we present that to the business, okay? Now, there are multiple ways, and you also want to improve your team. And what I call is uh, really after we get the budget, we want to optimize these, our automation efforts, okay? And effort opt optimization, uh, optimization really allows us uh, to view and analyze uh, the amount of automation ac or across a period, and we are able to really demonstrate to the team and to the management or the company how automation is really paying off. And the next graph that I'm going to show you, or the metric we use, is what we call is effort optimization. Using the same release, what we did is. We took our release, and we obviously we in this release we're using agile methodology. We're various different sprints. 
which happened to be was from existing release. We brought in about a thousand test cases, and there is no automation. There was no automation when we got involved. There was no automation, but we were able to get a budget for automation. We started automating in Sprint One, and as we are testing this product, we are adding new test cases, and we are, you know, in, from Sprint One to Sprint Two, we automated about 150 test cases. Now you will notice that even though we added 50 test cases new. But our manual effort is not 1,000, it's about 900 now. And the next release automation effort is really only about 800. So as you can see, the manual effort continues to reduce. And well, what you want to do is now you want to showcase to the business. You want to show them hey, how your automation is actually adding value. Your value is how much manual effort you are saving. Okay? I'm going to show you a trend line here. If you look at my trend line, um, Looks pretty good. And from sprint one to sprint two, we really saved about 14% of manual effort. Looks great. And 30% and looks even better. You know, we're on a we're real upward trend. And if you take that to the business and you know, when you you know when you have your reviews or meetings or whatever, hey, did you give us this budget, this is how we're utilizing it, so you can get continue to get funding for your automation. And this also really tells you what your goals are. Are you really meeting your goals that you set up front? Hey, this is what my automation goal should be, or this is what manual testing should be, or do you need to make any adjustments? And even more importantly, this helps you as a manager to look at it and see, hey, am I on track? Because if you look at this thing here, when we worked on this project, there was a challenge here. From sprint one to sprint three, we made great progress. We, you know, 30% of manual effort is saved. But between sprint three and four, it's only 6%. Our sort of automation manual effort saved is plateauing out. And that is what we're talking about. How do you measure your automation? Okay. How do you utilize your resources effectively? Okay. And there, and we are going to get into a little more into drill down here. I want to know what happened between sprint three and sprint four. Uh, why did my uh, manual effort plateau out 36%? And the first thing we do is, like I mean anything, and we're going to look at it, how are my tasks distributed? Again, as you know, one of the challenges that I had was, uh, one of the challenges that I have is whenever we are in crunch mode, we tend to move our automation resources to do manual testing because that's what we want to do, okay? Because manual effort is, can be easily seen how we are making progress, okay? And, and the first, the chart, next chart I'm going to show you is very, very simple. But believe me, it's, it's, it's again one of those charts which is uh, uh, you really need to pay attention to because if you have uh, resources defined up front, how much should be on automation and how much should be on manual. And that's a very basic chart, and that's what we call is a task distribution chart. Okay? In Sprint 4, we look at it, how much effort did we put on automation? It shows you that we spent... 30% of the time on automation, and we spend 70% of the time on manual testing. And as your manager, you look at it, hey, was this the time I had estimated? If that's yes, then great. And But that still doesn't tell us why we plateaued out. But let's look at sprint three. Is that how much time we spent on automation? We looked at sprint three in this real life example. Yes, that was pretty much what we spent on sprint three also. If that happened, then I know there is a problem. Okay, I need to look into it further. You know, there's a challenge. Excuse me. So the way you do that is I'm going to take my automation to pi because that's what I'm really optimizing. I'm going to blow that up. I'm going to look into it a little bit. Well, what happened? And this is what we call is a cost distribution. And when we blow it up, in automation, there, there are five major activities we focus on. And this chart really is very, very helpful uh, for you to see where your automation team is focused. Are they focusing on test case creation? Are they working on framework development? Are they working on maintaining the test suites? Or are they reviewing the scripts and fixing scripts? Or where they, are they spending time on execution analysis? Why this is important? Because this helps you optimize. If your team is doing less test case creation, guess what? that means you're saving less time on manual effort, okay? Your test case creation has to continue to go up, okay? And this chart also tells you if you're spending time, more time on reviewing and fixing scripts, 
maybe there are challenges with your framework. So you want to fix your, uh, uh, maybe you want to fix your framework. So this chart is very, very important. And, and we look at it. This chart, what does this tell us right now? This particular chart is telling us that our test case creation is 10%, and when we reviewed it with Sprint 3, our test case automation creation was higher than 10%. Now we know that's where the problem is, okay? And we're going to continue to drill down further now what's happening, okay? We'll look at the next chart. The next chart that we use is what we call as a test case automation velocity. Okay, what is test case automation velocity? Um, again, we believe, we believe in measuring everything we do. And just like we got the budget from the management, same way with our team, before we start a project, we sat down, we reviewed the project, this is what we need to automate, and what kind of a productivity will we get from your team? And it's not me who's deciding, it's really your uh, automation architect, your lead automation engineer, or your automation team. They sit down, they look at what kind of work they have, and as you know, there is some complex test cases, there are simple test cases, and we understand that, you know, all your productivity will not be same from week to week. And what we have found, if we set some sort of a boundary, what is the expected maximum, what is the expected minimum, if you set the boundary, and that really helps us uh, measure our uh, team's productivity. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. So we have a test case automation velocity, uh, in this particular project, we have set the boundaries, uh, 45 is maximum, 36 is the minimum, and now I can really measure it. Did my team really hold up to what they signed up to, okay? Did they held up to what they signed up to? And <clears throat> when we do that, when we plot it, then we look at it, that our team really was doing fairly Good, on week one, yes, productivity is a little bit low, but as you know, there's a framework development needs to happen, and the, the, the radius of the product may not be in a good stage as it's still developing, so the automation is going up slowly. But between week three and week four, the productivity dropped quite a bit. Okay? And then we picked back up on week five, six, seven, eight. And, and that really tells us that there was something that went wrong week three. We still don't know but we know that our team's velocity uh, was low, okay? And now we need to get into this stuff. And again, all these charts, what we're showing you is uh, they really are part of your culture, They're, and you, you measure them. And what we do is the next thing we're gonna look at is, we have already looked at the team velocity. We're going to look at that task, I mean, really team's effort distribution. And next chart is a, I love this chart. And uh, this chart, team effort distribution chart, is uh, in one, single snapshot, it sort of shows you where your automation team is really focusing their effort week by week, okay? And as QA manager, I want to see a lot more blue, dark blue in this chart and very little red. Because if I'm doing a lot more blue, which means I'm doing creating test cases, I'm automating them, I am saving manual effort. But if I'm seeing a lot of maintenance, that means I'm not doing creating test cases. I am losing time, I'm losing resources, and something is wrong, I gotta look into this, okay? So by looking at this one chart, you can see how you're doing. Well, if you look at this chart initially, a lot of the effort was spent on framework development, which is expected, because uh, the teams are really uh, the working on solidifying the framework. And initially, there's a lot of more time is being spent on reviewing and fixing. That, again, is because the product may not be ready yet, and we still need to spend some time. So this chart really does help you in one single snapshot, okay? That from a team effort distribution. But now the challenge is we know there's a problem, and how do we go for an individual engineer level? We gotta really look at how our engineers are doing, okay? The way we do that is what we call is a engineer's velocity by engineer. And just like um, you, you, look, you look at it when we dig deeper into this, is uh, engineer test case automation velocity. Here you see, again, you see the maximum and minimum. Well, we had the, earlier we had a maximum and minimum for a uh, team. Now we have it for an engineer. Some of your theory types will say, oh, there's a bug, and there were, you know, green was 17, and that was 13. Well, that's, we're using that as an average as well, okay? So what is our engineer's test case automation velocity? In this particular team, there were three automation engineers working on it. 
And Kevin and Comet, as you can see, there's a good trend. They are uh, essentially writing their scripts, and the test case automation is continuing to go up. And week four, it dipped. On the other hand, we have John, whose productivity has always been closer to the minimum line. And up around the week four, it actually went down below the uh, expected minimum. So now we know there's a problem. There's a problem really with an engineer. Um, we still don't know is is it John's code? We don't know if it's a framework issue. Uh, we still don't know. Uh, we really have no idea. Uh, but we know there's a problem um, starting from from our effort optimization chart, from our, uh, our really the team's velocity. So how how do we narrow this down further? What we have done is we have gone. Next, we call is the engineer's effort distribution chart. Again, all of this is related to automation. All of this is, uh, again, going back to the similar charts. In this effort distribution chart, you will look at it. Again, those five elements, test suite maintenance, framework development, test case automation, reviewing and fixing, execution analysis. And what it does is that it tells you the effort by each engineer, where they are really putting their effort. And when we look at this chart, this chart shows you that Kevin and Kamath are constantly and consistently they're higher on test case creation. And John is consistently spending time in the areas either in test suite maintenance or reviewing and fixing the code. And and then that's a challenge, right? And so as a manager now, you need to go and have a conversation with John and really understand what his challenges are. It could be and the feature he's working on is really buggy or is not ready to go, or John just is not a good coder. I don't know. Okay, and 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 then that really give what that enables you to do is you know really from getting your budget to optimize your effort and help you utilize your resources effectively. Okay, and this is my last graph for today. And there are a lot of other metrics you know we use, but these eight seem to resonate well with our clients. And, and and let's do a recap of all the ad metrics that we've gone through in this webinar. The first one we talked about was break-even in automation. What is break-even in automation? It, it helps you get a budget. You go to your management team. Um, hey, uh, how, how do you get budget so you can start your automation effort? And the next one we talked about was the effort optimization. And the effort optimization chart is you can show your management that, hey, you are continue to create value by the budget they have given you, and effort optimization chart really helps you see uh, how you're really making progress, uh, how you're saving on the manual effort, and helps you recognize if there is a, gives you early warnings if there are challenges or not. And if there are challenges, the next chart we have is a task distribution chart. This really tells you are your resources really deployed properly, Automation resources are really doing automation, and manual resources are doing manual testing. And also, if you really, if you need it, you can you know, move those resources around. It's up to you as a manager. But these charts really help you do that. And once you've done the task distribution chart, the next you look at is really the task distribution automation chart, because we want to drill down on that one. And uh, uh, if you look at that, this sort of shows you where your engineers are really focused. And if you see a challenge with that, then you look at your, you know, test case automation velocity, overall team, and that tells you if your team is really producing. And and each one of these charts really builds on itself, and you don't have to look at uh, all of them. You can look at one, or you can look at all of them to see if there is a problem. Uh, team effort distribution chart again tells you uh, what really is happening on the, um, what your team is really focusing on. Are they really um, spending most of their time in test case automation creation because that's where they should be spending time. If they are not, then we look at uh, um, engineers' test case automation velocity, make sure that each engineer is producing, each engineer is pulling their own weight, and uh, they're not dragging other team members down. And that's when the last chart comes in. And if there is a problem, you can really see if there is a, if there is a challenge with an engineer, if there's a challenge with the product, if there's a challenge with the framework, and, and make sure each you have a productive member of your team, each one of your productive member of your team, okay? 
Great, that's a recap. And, and I hope I've given you some food for thought. And uh, of, of course, every QA team and business uh, has its own unique set of goals. Um, but each of these metrics are based on principles that can be applied to your specific team. Okay? And, and today, we looked at, looked at some of the challenges we faced and showed you the metrics uh, that we have implemented over the years with various projects to overcome these roadblocks. Uh, and I, I really hope that you can use some of the ideas here to get budget for your automation efforts and really show an add value to your team and your business. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. And I wish you the best as you enhance your automation and wish you the best in your automation journey. Uh, take care, everyone. And I'm going to hand it back over to Rick for q and Rick. Excellent. Thank you, Rajiv. <clears throat> and uh, I, really, I think you gave us a great overview of some metrics that, we, that can be used. I think it's good insight and um, for many of the listeners here. And I think there's a lot here that can be adapted to fit the uniqueness of any QA team. And so we do have some minutes open. We left some minutes open for the Q&A. And we have some great questions already that people have provided. So, um, And also, for all of you listeners, if you have not um, asked any questions and have any questions, please don't hesitate to enter them into the Q&A box now, and, and we'll try to get to them. So now for Q&A, uh, we do have multiple questions here. And Rajiv, I'm going to do my best to ask you the most relevant ones um, to start, and then we can get into any other ones if we have time. OK, so a question that I am seeing a lot of you know, about is around the data. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, first ask a few questions up front before I summarize the questions. But I, I'm just going to I'm going to share a few questions here. So Jason he asked, what tools do you use to gather these metrics? Um, he uh, Rohit asked, how do you come up with the data for all these charts? All right, where's the data at? So that's a question. How do you track the team, right? So, so there's a lot of questions around, I mean, really about how in the world, <laughs> if I may ask, do you get this data? So um, I'll let you, you start on that question. <laughs> Give me the hardest <laughs> question up front. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a question that gets asked really from us all the time. And uh, it's really not a difficult question for us us to answer. Um, initially it was. And however, as you know, we are a remote team. Uh, a lot of our engineers are remote and there are in engineers on site as well. Um, and, and then the culture that we've built is we have a measuring culture. Okay. And obviously we use a lot of tools to collect that data. And uh, the, the tools that we use are ordinary tools that many of you guys use, you know, for your Test case management system or agile management or your defect tracking or your time task management tools. You know, tools tools like everyday tools, you know, whether it be Jira or TestRail or Zephyr or Gold Mine or uh, your Test Track Pro, I mean for bug band, bug database or liquid planner. Um, I could go on and on with tools. Okay. And using a combination of these tools, um, we can really holistically evaluate the team's performance. However, uh, having said that, really to track this data, we define um, a, a process or a you know, structure, uh, and I'll take an example of JIRA. Okay? And we go take an example of JIRA, we define a process or structure in JIRA, or you could use any trust tracking system, really, uh, that is implemented at the start of the process. And throughout the project, um, once an engineer finishes at the end of the day, end of the day they enter the work they did during the day. Um, and in, in JIRA, we would define these categories, say, how much time did you spend on framework development, what task is creation, or whether you're reviewing and fixing the code. Basically, using those metrics, they enter that tool. And it takes no more than five minutes or 10 minutes max to enter that data. Now we have the data recorded, and we can measure it. And we can use that data to improve. Um, I wish I had a magic pill that I can tell you this is how you do this, 
um, it's it's in our culture, and uh, and and uh, that's really where you need to go to. You got to have a measuring culture, and uh, enter that data. I mean, we have gone to clients uh, who even use uh, spreadsheets to track this data. I don't recommend it. <laughs> They're very old, but uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of these modern tools, you know, such as Jira, that you can use to track this data and uh, measure uh, measure on it. Okay. Okay. Good. So. So there's tools that can present the data for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like there's also a little bit of manual effort that is required to enter the data in so we can present this data in this type of format. Right, and, and also, again, yeah, uh, uh, some of the question, you know, some of the things that I get to hear from people is, uh, well, you know, you really are tracking every micro detail here, and sometimes we even get blamed for are we micromanaging this stuff, <laughs> right? All right. Um, well, uh, not really. I mean, uh, what we do is really uh, we're measuring it really with an intent to improve our processes and improve our personnel and uh, for successful execution and tracking for projects really and we educate our members this is why we're doing this we're not there to micromanage you we're not we're really here to improve the process the productivity uh, and optimize our efforts mm -hmm. oh, sorry long-winded answer but no, that's good, and that's actually uh, there's another question about uh, managing the team. So that I think you kind of hit that hit on that one there, yeah. right? Um, so that's good. Uh, you know, you also talk about you know so you know there's that question, and then there's another question about um, the time it takes. So I think you addressed this question a little bit in that um, you know there's tools that we can use, and maybe five minutes in, per day for an engineer to enter in some data. Um, there's another question here that says, how much time does a manager need to devote on a daily, weekly basis in order to generate these kind of metrics? So maybe you can give a little bit more visibility on what your thoughts are on how much time should be spent on this stuff. Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, how much time does a manager need to devote? Uh, frankly, personally, um, from my point of view, managers need to be uh, spending time with their team uh, defining the structure up front. Hey, this is what we're going to be automating. This is how we're going to be measuring it. Uh, a lot of this, you know, metrics we have defined up front. Hey, how many test cases are you going to automate? What's going to be maximum? What's going to be minimum? There's simple. There's complex. We define all of that up front. And then a manager is responsible for working with the team, uh, modifying whatever the task tracking system they may be using or and so they can track what the team's per, you know, team is doing during the day. Okay, at the end of the day, an engineer enters the data. Um, my hope is that if you have um, outlined your processes and your team is following those processes and you have empowered your team and educated them why you're creating these metrics, uh, managers shouldn't have to spend a whole lot of time, but I mean, very little time, really. Um, I use I used to, I mean, not anymore. And my teams now really use these as dashboards. Um, they can go pretty much, uh, you know, any time and see what's really happening in the project. Yeah, it's not a real-time information, but maybe a day old because it was entered at the end of the day. Uh, and all this data really is gathered by the team. We empower our teams to even measure themselves, measure each engineer. Uh, and manager's job is really to guide them how to do this. Mm -hmm. That that's. That's the way we do it. Mm -hmm. um, the unit really is the culture, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. Um, we, we got a lot of really good questions here, by the way. So I'm going to do my best to do justice to all of you who've asked great questions. And um, if we have to ask some offline, um, we'll be happy to do that as well or answer some of them offline. We'd be happy to do that as well. So, um, I, you know, there were there were in the poll. There's a lot of um, people who who had smaller teams, um, and there's one question here. So I think this one would be relevant to a lot of the people who are listening today. Uh, this question says, "Do smaller teams also need metrics?" So um, that's the question. I'd imagine just you know, as, as a you know, maybe as a smaller team, you have more visibility into each person. You might have more visibility into, uh, you know, how they integrate with the rest of the product and all that stuff. So I guess the question is, do you feel that you need metrics for smaller teams? Uh, that's a great question, you know, and and 
One of the things I've always focused on is to have as little tribal knowledge as possible. And and why I say that is really, even if it's a smaller team, yes, I can go over to my team and I can really monitor them or, um, and we're very well connected and uh, um, see what their performance is, what their productivity is. Uh, and uh, that that is true. However, we, you know, the hope is the team will grow. And even if you need to measure it, right? Uh, how are you going to measure it? A lot of the time, it really becomes an anecdotal data. It's not a hard facts and figures. When I go to get budget from uh, uh, CFO, they are really interested in numbers. They are not interested in me telling them, yes, this automation makes sense. Okay, oh, I've never really been able to get a budget saying that, hey, I want to be able to do automation, give me X budget. Uh, but when I tell them I need a budget because I'm just going to cost me this much, this is all I'm going to save you, then the CFO really wants to know, hey, did you really deliver? And how am I going to deliver? I'm going to give them facts and figures. So uh, absolutely, you got to measure, even if it is seen as small. Um, you have to measure them. And uh, and then they're really helpful for you know growing your talent. I mean, one of the things we didn't talk about is uh, all these metrics r really help you uh, grow your team and you actually even help you manage your career. And uh, if you are tracking this progress, then there are no surprises towards the end of uh, managing an engineer's career. Uh, I know I'm digressing here a little bit, but uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, yes, even for a smaller team, metrics are required and, uh, and you should record them. Okay, good, awesome. All right, let me see here if there's some other questions. I feel like there's a few questions here on the team reaction. I mean, you talked about micromanaging versus measuring earlier. Uh, there's another question here that says, how do you expect engineers to react when they know that they will be measured through metrics? So, huh? I'm sorry, can you repeat <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, reading it as I get on here. So how do you expect engineers to react when they know that they will be measured through metrics? Are these QA engineers? Yes, I would assume so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, in QA, that's all we're doing. We're always measuring. We're always measuring how are we performing? Uh, what's, uh, how is our product performing? Um, and, and that's how we improve. We present we identify risk for the business. We present hard data to the business so the business can make decisions. And uh, that's how uh, my career, I frankly, I've built teams uh, that that way by measuring. And if you want my honest opinion, if an engineer is bothered by being measured, I don't care. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just don't. I mean, uh, if I can't measure it, I cannot improve it. I, I mean, I'm, again, I hope that a good leader, you are showing them uh, you're, you're really what to do, not exactly telling them how to do it. That's what a good leader does. And then you hopefully you've explained to them why these metrics are important. I hope I've demonstrated to the audience here uh, these metrics really do help you uh, uh, get budget, you know, optimize your automation and uh, really you know, identify problems early on and hit those problems early on, identify problem areas, whether it's the code, whether it's the engineer. I hope I've demonstrated that in, in these graphs. Uh, yeah, you got to be measured. And if you're bothered by it, sorry. Perfect. Awesome. Let's see. We, we have a minute or two left. Yep. Um... So let me look at a few more questions here. Oh, so, so this, is, this is a good question, Rajiv. So this one says, this is by Martin, it says if each test automation engineer's performance is highly tied to the total number of test cases written, right, which we talked about here today, um, won't it force engineers to avoid reviewing, fixing minor bugs in test scripts and only focus on writing minor, not as mission critical test cases? So, will, you know, again, will, will they not do the other work and only pick the easy test cases to automate, basically? Oh, absolutely not. I hope I'm not giving you that impression that you're going to write bad.
Rick and Rajiv, it's Christina from SAS Labs. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but it sounds like you guys uh, are on mute or we can't hear you anymore. Give a minute to see if the audio comes back. Um, sometimes, uh, Rick, if you pause and, and restart, um, that can work. See what happens. Okay, well, um, oh, we hear you that, now. No, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, we hear okay, you, you now. Can. Okay, that was weird. Sorry. Uh, where do we where do we drop off, Christina? Um, pretty much right after that question. Um, I think I don't think you read the next question yet. Okay, so I think the so so. Um, okay, so basically, yeah, the question from Martin around, um, you know, how we how our quality of code. Is our number one priority, and there's a lot of things that you know Rajiv mentioned um, may have cut off or not around setting some standards up front with peer reviews and the standards for code quality and things like that. So, oh great, and then, Christina, can you still hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, great. All right. So that was that question. Any any other comments on that? No, I think that's it. Okay. I mean, quality of code is number one priority. I mean, okay. there's a reason that okay. that quality of code. Yes. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Talked about the tools. I'm just I'm scanning through some more more questions. We had quite a bit that came in. We talked about. Um, yeah. So I think we're. I think we're uh, pretty much out of time, so um, we have some. We, we were able to answer a lot of the questions. If there's any that we didn't get, we'd love to answer them offline. And um, from here, I would just like to remind everyone that we have a free white paper, and uh, you can uh, download that white paper at qasource.com forward slash 20 dash metrics. And um, FYI, the metrics in the white paper are metrics that we've learned from doing business over the last 12 years. And of course, they're ones that we've used with our clients and our clients have used with us. And, and um, of course, we've adapted them too to, to meet Absolutely. those needs. And we have uh, used the ones that make sense for the goals that are set, right? So that they're very adapted. Um, okay, so great. So again, Rajiv, I just want to thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you to everyone here for listening and for participating and for asking really good questions. And also thank you to Sauce Labs for hosting the webinar. Sauce Labs is a great partner and, and really a fantastic tool when you're doing automation. And um, with that, we hope that you all have a wonderful day. And uh, I look forward to you joining us next time. And with that, I'll back over to Sauce Labs to close out the webinar. And I just wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, I hope, uh, I wish you the best in your journey. Okay. Great, yeah, and, and thanks to both of you, and thank you so much, Rajiv. I thought that was a great presentation. Um, just last note, uh, to summarize, we will be sending out the recording in the slides tomorrow. Um, if your question did not get addressed and you would like um, to get in touch with somebody, you can email webinar at softlabs.com and I'll get you in touch with either someone at QA Source or if you want some more information about um, Soft Labs and our uh, test automation um, tool, we can get you that as well. Thanks everyone for attending and have a great day. Thank you.